It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Thornton. Uh, Dr. Thornton and I are both colleagues at Cook Children's Medical Center. Um, both of us have had the privilege of being involved in um, multiple sponsored uh, growth hormone trials. So we've had a, a taste of growth hormone therapy, uh, both uh, conventional growth hormone as well as long acting um, growth hormone. Um, so Dr. Thornton, um, also, in addition to um, all of his clinical research, is obviously, as many of you know, um, very much a, a nationally and internationally recognized um, uh, person in the, the or position in the, the field of uh, congenital hyperinsulinism and hypoglycemia. Um, so we're giving him a break from that today, and he's going to give us an update on long-acting growth hormone. Thank you very much, Joel. And uh, it is a pleasure to be invited to Pastola. And uh, let's get started. Let's not get started. So why is the mouse not working here? Are these not working? <laughs> Did you get that going? It's based on. Okay, we're good now. Okay, um, I've had no new disclosures or conflicts of interest since this morning's readout, but they did miss that I uh, have received funding from um, Ascendus and all of the long acting growth hormone companies for uh, research work. Okay, so what I'd like to do today is review the history of long acting growth hormone and then talk a little bit about the effectiveness of some of the current FDA approved long acting growth hormone therapies. And I'm actually going to probably discuss uh, some non FDA uh, drugs that are approved outside of the country. So we'll talk a little bit about the Chinese growth hormone and then talk a little bit about safety data in the current products. So as you all know, growth hormone deficiency is very common, one in three and a half to 4,000 children. The current standard of care is daily uh, growth hormone in doses of 0 0.18 to 0 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per day, or, um, per day, no, per week, sorry, that's a typo. And um, pubertal dosing of up to 0 0.7 milligrams has been FDA approved for a nootropa. And one of the big issues with daily growth hormone is uh, compliance and how children are able to continue to give growth hormone every day for many, many years. And so finding a long acting growth hormone preparation has been the holy grail of uh, growth hormone therapy. Although some people might argue that finding an oral preparation uh, would be even better. Um, and here's a couple of studies that uh, have addressed the issue of compliance with daily growth hormone. And in this study here, 10% uh, of patients missed more than 15 injections a month. And in the study out of New Zealand, 66% of patients missed at least one injection per week. And in a Spanish study, uh, there was moderate to poor adherence in 33.5% of patients. And so the consequences of this are uh, basically uh, less efficient growth and a decrease in uh, annualized growth velocity. And so some suggest, there is a suggestion that overall that non-adherence with daily growth hormone can occur in up to 70% of all patients. Now, as we've looked at the near uh, adult height outcomes of daily growth hormone therapy, you can see in the blue uh, compared to the green in all of these different uh, post-marketing surveillance database studies, that nobody has really achieved a mean um, height standard deviation score of, of um, greater than minus 0 0.5 standard deviation scores. And so although we know that many children, um, the parents of many children who have isolated growth hormone uh, deficiency are slightly smaller than the population, we've still not been able to achieve growth uh, back to complete normality. And so, hence uh, the desire to develop a long acting growth hormone. Now, I'm sure those of you who are old enough will remember, like I do, uh, when the first patients were treated in growth hormone in 1958, and then recombinant daily growth hormone was approved in 85. Um, but the first ever really long acting growth hormone 
that made it to the market was Nootropin Depot. And then uh, products have been approved in Korea and China. And uh, then in the United States, Sequoia uh, from Novo uh, was the first adult long-acting growth hormone approved. And then uh, last August, Skytrofa from Ascendus uh, was approved as the first weekly uh, growth hormone for pediatric growth hormone deficiency in patients greater than, what, 11 and a half kilos? As a 13, 11 and a half. So how do you make a drug a long-acting drug? Um, so um, there are many ways you can do that. So one way is to delay absorption from the subcutaneous space. And so that's done by incorporation of the drug into microspheres that eventually break down and release the drug. Uh, other ways are to slow the clearance from circulation, and that can be combined with polyethylene glycol or PEG in a permanent pegylation, or it can be in a reversible pegylation. You can make fusion proteins with synthetic polypeptides or with naturally occurring uh, polypeptides such as the HCG, or you can fuse it to albumin. Um, and the effect of all of these uh, different things are that you either make a growth hormone that's released more slowly or um, that stays in the circulation longer. Now, early attempts uh, to make long-acting growth hormones started back in the 70s and Barbara Lippi um, uh, reported a study where they used a growth hormone gel and um, this failed because they were unable to get adequate IGF-1 or they were unable to reach adequate systemic uh, growth hormone concentrations. And then Nova Nordisk had a pegylated recombinant growth hormone that they discontinued studies on due to unsatisfactorily weekly IGF-1 profiles. And the first one to make it was Nootropin Depot. And so this is a micronized particles of recombinant growth hormone embedded in a biocompatible, biodegradable PLG microspheres. And it was administered as a subcutaneous infection, sorry, injection. <laughs> And um, those of you who saw the shots, you might see why I said the first word. <laughs> and uh, it was given at 0 0.75 milligrams uh, every two weeks or 1.5 milligrams a month. And it got FDA approved in December uh, 1999. And actually, I, this was probably the first uh, long acting growth hormone study that I had participated in. And so let's look at the uh, the studies that got to FDA approval. So uh, they performed a multi-center open label uh, clinical study in prepubertal children, mean age 7.4 years, who had idiopathic or organic growth hormone deficiency. There were 91 uh, growth hormone naive patients and they were divided into treatment of 1.5 milligrams uh, uh, per kilo once monthly or 0 0.75 milligrams per kilo uh, twice monthly by subcutaneous injection. The mean uh, pre-study growth rate was 4.8 centimeters uh, per year. So these had severe growth impairment. And uh, the uh, first, the, the mean annualized growth rate after six months uh, on therapy was 8.4 uh, centimeters per year. Now uh, in this slide, you can see the IGF-1 levels and in the dark lines, you can see the twice monthly injection. And you can see that they rapidly get an increase of IGF-1 levels um, that gradually returns to back to normal over two weeks. And that this pattern is repeated. So you have reasonably good IGF-1 levels. On the other hand, with the once a month injection in the dotted line, you can see that after approximately two weeks, the levels are actually very low. And so this was actually reflected in their, their annualized growth velocity. Now, after the first six month study, they had uh, 76 patients who continued treatment in an extension study. And overall, their annualized growth velocity over one year was 7.8 centimeters uh, for the two dose groups combined. The change in height SDS score was 0 0.5 SDS, and the change in bone age was one year over the course of uh, one year. However, almost 20% of the patients discontinued due to dissatisfaction with growth. And at the time, they didn't do uh, the studies like we're doing now, where you usually compare to a daily growth hormone. But at that time, the current uh, growth hormone of the day, protropin, and then 
the first recombinant are not the first. Their, their recombinant growth hormone neutrophin um, was receiving first year growth rates of 10.1 to 11.3 centimeters per year, which is significantly better than the rate achieved with the depot preparation. Um, from an adverse event perspective, these injections were not very well tolerated. And out of 138 pediatric patients, there were reported two to three injection site adverse reaction per injection, not per patient, per injection. And so the biggest one was nodules. So you could come back a week, two weeks later, and you could feel the lump under the skin and you could feel the last three or four injections uh, because of the big lumps. Erythema, the, they became uh, quite reddened with the injection. There was pain both uh, during the injection and post-injection, uh, a lot of bruising and lipoatrophy. And so it was not, um, and then the dosing schedule was problematic because if you wanted to take the 1.5 milligram dose uh, once monthly, and you were uh, between 30 and 45 kilos, which is a 10 to say 13 year old child, typically you were talking about three injections at, at the time. And if you were over 45 kilos, they didn't even recommend it because you needed so many injections that it was almost equal to once, once daily. Um, but even the twice monthly, um, as you reach the end of your growth, you were up to two to three injections um, per two week period. Uh, so it was not surprising to us, those of us who were involved with that product that it removed from the market in June of 2004. And the decision was cited as being based on the significant resources required by both companies to continue manufacturing, manufacturing and commercializing the product. Um, but I, th I think it, it was clear to all of us at the time that the annualized growth velocity was just not sufficiently good to warrant the pain and discomfiture of the shots. Now, uh, this is a table um, uh, given to me by Brad Miller showing um, some of the non-FDA approved products that are currently in preparation. And you can see here um, in the depot formula, Eutropin Plus, was approved and marketed in Korea. It's approved in Europe, but it's not yet being marketed. Uh, Gintralong uh, is a Chinese growth, long-acting growth hormone that's approved and marketed in China. Um, Somapacitin or Sogroya is the Novo product that's approved for adults. And the ongoing phase three studies are being uh, reported out. And then Somatrogen, the Opco Pfizer uh, product, uh, completed the phase three studies and the filings are underway with the FDA. And so we'll talk about some of those products. So let's start off with some somapacitin or Sabroya. Uh, this is the Novo Nordisk product um, that is made into a long acting drug by non-covalent um, albumin binding. And so this was manufactured by inserting a single point mutation into the recombinant growth hormone that had a side chain of 1.3 kilodalton terminal fatty acid with non-covalent albumin binding properties, uh, which meant that the growth hormone could bind to albumin and then it could stay in the circulation. Uh, the nice thing about this product is it's 23 kilodaltons in size, so it's not particularly bigger than a native um, or biological growth hormone. And so it does penetrate the growth plate and activate the growth hormone receptor in all the different tissues. And this can be a problem with some of the larger growth hormones that may not penetrate the growth plate. And therefore you may not get that direct effect of growth hormone on, um, on the growth plate that's independent of IGF-1 production. And in this slide, I'd, I'd like you to focus on the dark blue colors uh, here. Um, so in the phase two studies, they basically com compared three doses, 0 0.04 milligrams per kilo per week, 0 0.08 milligrams per kilo per week, and 0 0.16 with daily growth hormone, 0 0.24 milligrams per kilo per week. And I'm going to focus primarily on the 0 0.16 because that's the dose that went down into the phase three studies. And you can see at the end of six months here, the annualized growth velocity, 
uh, was 12.9 centimeters uh, compared to 11.4, so a treatment difference of 1.5 centimeters, which was an excellent response and indicated that somapacitin was non-inferior to daily growth hormone. And then at the end of uh, an extension trial at 52 weeks, um, it was actually superior to daily growth hormone. So again, an, a very nice result. Um, this is the um, IGF-1 levels. And again, in the red circles, we're just focusing on the 0 0.16 milligram per kilo um, per week dose. And you can see the trough values here, the peak values here with the model derived average here. And you can see that it's above uh, zero SDS and it is slightly better than the daily growth hormone IGF-1 levels. And so as you will see with the um, Skytropha, that um, some of these longer acting uh, growth hormones do give you better IGF-1 levels and that seems to translate into better growth. Now the Soma Trojan product uh, manufactured by Pfizer and Opco um, is a recombinant growth hormone combined with three carboxy terminal peptides and these are actually from HCG. And this is how it prolongs the circulatory half-life the product itself is uh, 40 to 41 kilodalton, so it is much larger um, than some mapacitin. It's administered uh, once weekly, and um, it's currently in phase three studies, and those studies have been submitted and are under regulatory review with the FDA. Now, I'm going to review two studies that uh, use this product. We talk about first the Japanese phase three study, which was a 52-week open-label uh, dose escalation control trial. It was a one-to-one -one ratio of long-acting versus daily growth hormone. The doses were escalated up to 0 0.66 milligrams per kilo per week over the course of the first couple of months, and then maintained and compared to a daily growth hormone of 0 0.18 milligrams per kilo per week. And you can see here the annualized growth velocity was 9.65 for the weekly versus 7.87, showing that somat somatrogen was non-inferior to daily growth hormone. And then there was a global phase three study with 84 sites in 21 different countries that enrolled 224 patients, 109 male, or, um, and assigned them 109 into um, long acting growth hormone, 115 into daily. And they compared doses of 0 0.66 to 0 0.24 of the daily per kilo per week. And the endpoint was the analyzed growth velocity at month 12. And here you can see the treatment difference of 10.1 to 9.78 for daily growth hormone with a treatment difference of 0 0.33 and a 95% confidence interval here. And so you'll see a few of these graphs. This is the margin of non-inferiority. So if, if, the, if the mean and the 95th percentile confidence intervals are above the dotted line, it means non-inferiority. And if they're above the zero line, it means superiority. So here you can see that uh, this was non-inferior to daily growth hormone. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, another form of pegylated growth hormone, Gintralong, which is uh, approved in, Ch in China. And this is a branched uh, polyethylene glycol combined with recombinant growth hormone. And this one's even bigger, 58 to 66 kilodalton molecular weight. And their phase three study compared uh, 0.2 milligrams per kilo per week of pegylated growth hormone to daily growth hormone in a two to one ratio in 343 growth hormone naive patients over a six month period. And uh, in the red circles, you can see the height velocity IGF-1 and the height standard deviation scores at baseline. And you can see here that these were severely growth hormone deficient children with annualized growth velocities prior to treatment of 2.3 centimeters, no significant difference between the two groups. They had severely low IGF-1 levels and they were severely short with a height SDS of 4.5 and no significant difference between the two groups. And they had very low stimulated growth hormone levels. So these were very clearly very growth hormone deficient children. And here you can see the results of IGF-1. Um, over the 25-week uh, study period with the pegylated long acting uh, in the dark squares and the open triangles being daily growth hormone. And you can see that the long acting product achieved higher IGF-1 levels than the daily growth hormone. 
and then annualized growth velocity after six months of treatment uh, showed an excellent response with 13.4 centimeters per year annualized versus 12.6, so a treatment difference of 0.8 centimeters per year. Um, the delta height SDS was a one uh, standard deviation score, which is a very good response for the first six months of therapy. The adverse events were comparable um, with no antibodies found, no lipoatrophy. And there were no consequences of the polyethylene glycol noted in the monkey studies um, that were looked at uh, six month exposure. Now let's move on to our last drug, Skytropa, our transcon growth hormone, our lonopeg somatropin, depending on which name tickles your fancy. And this was FDA approved in 2021. And the announcement was that this was the first once weekly treatment for pediatric growth hormone deficient in children greater than 11.5 kilos. And um, this is a, a, the mechanism of prolonged action is that they made this into a prodrug, which has the native growth hormone attached by a transcon linker um, that uh, cleaves uh, when it's injected in the body, um, dependent on the pH and the temperature. And this is linked to a transcon carrier, which is a polyethylene glycol strand. And when in the prodrug form, it is not biologically active and it is not, it's not excreted through the kidneys. But over time, the unmodified growth hormone gets released, gets released, it binds to the growth hormone receptor. And because it's biological growth hormone, it acts identical to our native uh, growth hormone. And then the carrier and the linker are excreted out the kidneys. Um, now, there are three studies we're going to talk about over the next few minutes. The HIGH trial was a 52-week uh, study in growth hormone naive patients in which there was a comparison of lomapeg somatropin 0.24 milligrams per kilo per week to daily growth genotropin 0.24. The second study was the FLIGHT study, which was a 26-week study looking at children previously treated with growth hormone who were switched to lomapeg somatropin. And then the third study is the Enlightened study, which was a long-term open-label extension study for all the patients who participated in the previous two studies. So let's take the HYPE trial first, and the, the, these results have been published in JCEM recently. This was 161 treatment-naive patients. They were seen in 73 sites across 15 countries. There was a two-to-one randomization of lomapeg somatropin to daily growth hormone. And I mentioned the dose already, 0.24 milligrams of each per kilo per week. The children were all pre pubertal boys 3 to 12, girls 3 to 11. They all had to have a height standard deviation score of uh, greater than minus two standard deviations. They had to have a IGF-1 of greater than minus one. And they had to have growth hormone levels less than 10 on provocative testing and a bone age delay of more than um, six months. Um, so the primary endpoint was annualized growth velocity at one year. And here in the red circles, you can see the weekly lonopeg somatropin, 11.2 centimeters versus daily growth hormone, 10.3, um, giving an estimated uh, treatment difference of 0 0.9 centimeters. And uh, this was highly significant difference. Um, there was no change in the BMI between um, lonopeg somatropin and the daily growth hormone, um, which was comforting, indicating that the growth hormone was acting in all of the tissues similar to uh, native growth hormone. And the average IGF-1 was superior levels uh, and significantly higher in the lonopeg group at 0.7 SDSs versus uh, minus 0.02. And this was a significant difference. Um, from an adverse event perspective, the adverse event profile is very similar. And most importantly is there were no treatment emergent adverse events leading to discontinuation of the study drug. And uh, the bone age to chronological age ratio was similar in both groups. The tolerability and immunogenicity was similar in, in both groups. So there's no new uh, signals coming out with this long acting growth hormone. Now, when you look at the um, overall response, I showed you earlier that the overall response of lomapeg somatropin was superior to daily growth hormone. And in this, in this figure here, you can see it broken down in the different categories. And as I mentioned before, um, if you're over the 
line on the, the zero uh, treatment difference. If, if your 95% confidence interval is greater than it, then you're superior and you're not non-inferior if, it, if it's greater than uh, minus 2.5. And what you can see is that there are certain differences for younger children versus older children for those with um, growth hormone levels less than five or greater than five. But overall, everything was either superior or non-inferior to daily growth hormone. Um, IGF-1 levels were looked at very carefully in a subset of the population at 13 weeks. You can see the original IGF-1 level here at minus 2.5 and by 13 weeks, the baseline uh, trough IGF-1 level was minus 1.5 SDSs, rising up approximately to plus 0.5 SDS at somewhere between 48 hours and between two and two and a half days, and then dropping down to baseline at minus 1.5, and that there's a swing of approximately two standard deviations over the course of the time of the week. And so this is going to be very important, and we're all going to have to learn how to interpret IGF-1 levels on long-acting growth hormone and, you know, depending on what day you test it on. So a thing that's going to be a little different in the, you know, current management, I'm sure we'll hear about that later, is knowing what day your patient did their IGF-1 levels on compared to the weekly profile and then understanding how to adjust your dose based on uh, what the IGF level was on a certain day. And there's a very nice paper that was just published that really uh, guides the clinician on how to make those adjustments. Now, when we look at the IGF-1 levels um, in the height study, and we look at the children in blue who are on daily growth hormone versus green who are on lonopex homotropin, and then the daily growth hormone patients switched over in the enlightened study to long-acting growth hormone, you can see that their IGF-1 levels cut up very nicely and were identical in the second year of therapy to those who started out originally on uh, lonopex homotropin. And here you can look at the uh, gain in height SDS scores. And here's the original study, the height study, with again in green lonopex homotropin versus blue genotropin. And uh, in the beginning, there was no significant difference, but we, by the time you got to one year of treatment, there was a significant difference between the two groups. And when the daily growth hormone patients switched over to uh, lonopex homotropin, there was no loss of the difference in height velocity. In other words, they, they stopped growing slower and started to grow at the same speed. And then when you look at the previously treated patients, they obviously started at a higher SDS because they'd been treated for several years and their uh, height SDS score continued to improve over time. So for the two-year treatment data, which was uh, reported at the SP meeting last year, it was a combination of three phase three trials for two years of data, the height, flight, and enlighten. Um, the patients all continued to grow well. The safety profile was similar to daily growth hormone. And for those who switched from daily growth hormone to lonopex homotropin, the original growth disadvantage that they had did not continue to worsen. They didn't catch up, but they didn't lose any further ground. The IGF-1 levels caught up and matched those on lonopex homotropin, and this suggested an improved treatment effect for those patients rather than if they'd continued on daily growth hormone. So in conclusion, early attempts at generating long-acting growth hormone therapies were unsuccessful. In recent years, long-acting growth hormone drugs have been developed with similar safety and efficacy as daily growth hormone. In August of 2021, Lonopeg somatropin became the first FDA-approved once-weekly long-acting growth hormone for use in children. And we anticipate that several more long-acting drugs will come on the market in the next year or so. And hopefully, this will allow us to get a better near-final adult high due to better compliance. Um, <coughs> with no additional safety issues. So with that, I will uh, leave you a picture of Cook Children's Medical Center at night. And, um, and thank you very much for your attention. All right, so there is a virtual question. Are any of these long-acting growth hormone available for children in the US? 
the answer is yes. Uh, Skytrofa or Lonapeg somatropin got approved in um, August of 2021 and is now available. And in your experience, have there been any challenges in getting insurance approval? Uh, the answer to that is yes and no. Uh, there are challenges in getting uh, growth, the growth hormone approved. However, the company, as long as you're um, submitting the appeals, will provide the growth hormone. Um, and it's, in our experience, we're starting to see more, more insurance companies covering it. But it's like every new drug that comes out, it comes on the market, nobody's, uh, none of the insurances have it. And then as time goes on, it gets better and better. Um, and then there was another question, do we have many patients on lonopeg somatropin, any unexpected side effects? We have not seen any unexpected side effects. Most of the patients, I've seen, of course, we're reporting the studies that I just showed you the results of, and the patients we have on currently, we're not experiencing anything unusual.